Hello and welcome to the Michael Harding podcast. It's the beginning of the weekend. I'm in great form. I'm up in Donegal. Uh, I've had one jab. I hope I get my second one soon. I feel in good health. Thanks be to God. But I was looking back recently at notes I'd be taken and writing down 10 years ago. That was the really bad time in my life, I suppose, when I was really suffering depression and I felt bad in myself, you know. I felt negative. And I wrote a note one day in about 2011 saying, now it was winter, it was winter of 2011. And I remember writing, big events don't frighten me. I couldn't care about the imminent collapse of the euro or the implementation of the budget. It leaves me unmoved. But it is in tiny things that I fail, and in tiny failures that I am terrified. It's not on the ocean, but in small places that I perish. In fact, at the time, I didn't even feel I was included in big events. You know, I was alienated. I'd listened to the budgets and the announcements about economic cuts on the radio or the television as if I didn't quite belong in the world anymore. Depression can make you feel like that. You know, you feel alienated. You feel kind of disengaged. You're looking at the television and, and, and it, doesn't, it, it doesn't feel like your world. You know, you feel you're anonymous, you're helpless and you're lonely. And I was lonely and I used to be lying in bed. I'd lie in bed like till... Eight o'clock now, it'd be very dark in the winter, and um, you'd be wondering, will I turn on the radio? And then eventually I'd turn it on, and it'd be all negative stuff. And then I'd wonder, will I turn it off? Will I get out of bed? And the struggle to get out of bed was enormous. I remember one day there was a, there was a greeting card came in the post. It was lying in the hall. And it was from someone in Clare, and it contained a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh. It was very nice. Happiness is at your fingertips. All you have to do is reach out and touch it. That's what it said. Very nice, right? I didn't feel like that at all. There was no name on the card. And that infuriated me. Rather than read the card and listen to what the card was saying. Happiness is at your fingertips. All you have to do is reach out and touch it. It was a very beautiful thing for somebody to send me, to say to me when I was depressed, when I was in the darkest time of my life, in the middle of December. But no, I wasn't listening. I chose another way of going, and that was to get completely angry and infuriated about the fact that nobody had signed it. And then I would do things sometimes that make an effort, you know, to get myself out of bed and to be positive. And I remember I decided to vacuum clean the front room. And there, at least, that would be an achievement. I plugged in the machine and un unraveled the flex and I rubbed the carpet a few times. And I noticed that there was dust on the sofa from an incense stick I burned the night before. So I dismantled the long arm of the hoover and I poked the short nozzle into the crevices and around the armrests. And as I was doing this, hoover and the sofa, and before I could stop it, the machine had sucked up a ten euro note that was wedged behind the cushion. It was changed from a, a nag and a brandy that must have come out of my back pocket. And I saw the money fly up the spout of the hoover and I couldn't stop it and God was I angry. I had to open the machine and needless to say the bag inside was impossible to penetrate with my fingers so I ripped it asunder in a rage and I poked at the dust and I found the money. But by then I had covered the floor and the sofa with a bag full of dust. Oh, Lord God. In a funny way, even though my beloved partner was really feeding me life, feeding me encouragement and everything else, there's a strange way when you're depressed, it's like you're living alone. You know, you're with people and yet you're living alone. It's a very strange. I spent a lot of time alone. 
That's the way I saw it, in my own head. In a house, I suppose my study, the, the study had, you know, my shed studio had become a refuge. Particularly, in there, there was nobody else but me. And I remember after the episode with the Hoover, I was full of unfocused frustration. So I drove into town. And this is how one thing goes bad and you try to get out of that and it gets worse. I went into town and I went to a bakery and I chose a cherry cake and I said, that's a miserable day. In fact, it was mild and dry. Well, the woman behind the counter said, it's not that bad. Ah, but, says I, yesterday was rough. She said, it's not freezing. And it's not pouring rain. True, I agreed, but it's very dark. She said, it's December. And although a Cavan lake can be a foggy world in early December, I remember driving over there, thinking that a walk around Killikeen would do me good. And to my relief... The lake was grey and full of light. The lower half of the sky was a pale water colour and the woods around me were comforting. But then, of course, all of a sudden the sky darkened and hailstones surprised me. I stood under a tree until they ended and abruptly, as they had begun, it was over and standing before me Suddenly was a squirrel, a red squirrel, beautiful in shape, colour and fur, and beautiful in the independence of his mind. He cast his imperious eye on me for a moment and then raced up a tree to some unknown world. There are unknown worlds all around in the forest. And it's easy to believe in a veil beyond which humans go to small eternities when this life is over. But I didn't realise that the dark woods can hold so much light. Every last bit of colour in the evening sky lingered in the trees. Everywhere I looked Light came towards me, and even the potholes of rain on the pathway sucked in the light and gathered it and threw it back at me. And it's strange how, being so far removed from electric light, I could hear voices deep within me and feel a great realisation dawning on me. It was like a dream. I think that's where it began for me, the journey out of depression. In solitude, with everything going wrong, with everything being bleak, with the weather being dark, there was some tipping point inside me. There was some tipping point that said, like, I've, I've had enough darkness. I can't, like, I can't go on with this darkness. And suddenly I started to see the light. And it came like the light of winter on a dark winter's day. And it came beautifully out of out of the trees that you would think would be full of darkness. And yet there was a kind of a slanting light of winter coming through them at me. And I began to shift my focus. Like all day I had been thinking darkness. I had been choosing darkness. Nearly having an argument with the woman in the bakery because every time I said it's a bad day, it's an awful day yes, that it was a bad day, well at least it's very dark each time her joy was bouncing against me like but sure it's not a bad day but sure yes, that it wasn't that bad but sure it's December, what do you expect she was living in a different universe than me she was living in a joyful universe and her joy was coming across with the bun when she put the change in me hand, her fingers touched my palm. 
That was a biological engagement with her physically. But her joy was physical as well. Whatever way it affected the the vibrations in the room, the molecules in the air and the air molecules touching my nose and me breathing them in, I was breathing in her joy. It affected me like that. It's a funny thing the way joy can affect you from other people. And when I say that it was other people were my salvation when I was in depression, that's how I mean it. The powerful effect you can have on other people is absolutely extraordinary and beautiful and wonderful. And after that, I drove, as I said, to Cavan. I don't know why to Cavan and why to a lake in Cavan. Maybe because there was some psychic sense that Cavan is my mother. 365 lakes in Cavan. I was reared on the shoreline of various lakes. And I went there still wanting to choose darkness, believing in darkness and and depression and that everything is bad and terrible. And I, I couldn't resist. The first thing that hit me was that little squirrel. That little squirrel was so independent as, in his own mind. He looked at me, he eyeballed me. There's a great thrill when a wild animal eyeballs you. When a horse eyeballs you. There is such a thrill. But when a wild, a completely wild, feral animal that is beyond the kind of perimeters of our domestic behaviour and just looks at you, there's a thrill. And I got that, especially because he was red squirrel. Especially because the last thing I imagined to see in winter was a squirrel. I thought they all slept or something, but uh, who knows. And then he went off into a tree. And he, and he was gone. It was like, he has a world. You know, he has a, he has a conscious mind that may not be as sophisticated in his consciousness as mine. It may not have a kind of linguistic ability that I have. So therefore he cannot pattern his conscious experience in language. And maybe he doesn't have the imagination so that he cannot actually distance himself from what's happening in the present moment. He's in the present moment, but locked into the present moment. Whereas sometimes I'm locked out of the present moment. But there was so much power in his presence. And that's what I'd say was the second thing that affected me in recovering from depression was the awakening of the present moment in me, feeling that I wasn't locked out of anything, that I might feel alienated when I was looking at the television and looking at, you know, politics and big people having big events, but I really wasn't locked out of the universe. I was in the centre of the universe if I was where I was, standing where I am, standing under the trees in the woods in Cav, and I was in the centre of the universe. And I was awake. And those were the two things that helped me on the journey out of depression. One was the recognition of other people. And the kind of bounce of other people's love. And the bounce of, of presence and independence that came even in the eyeballing me of a wild animal. The sense that there is real universe there. There's real life, there's being, being is alive, being is here, being is now. And that tipping me over into some sense of being. So it came from those outside me who were, who were reaching to me in love. And it came from inside me. And the coming from inside was a really, really strange and interesting one that excited me because it awakened in me prayer. For the first time, maybe since I was a child, it, it awakened in me. It tipped me over from meditation into contemplation. I, I, I can't name it, but I was, I was being swept along. It wasn't me who was making an effort to sort of, you know, think myself into a, a prayerful disposition, but something was going on inside me that I, I began to acknowledge some sense that 
when I said the word prayer, I, it means listening. I'm listening to something inside me. I'm listening to something inside me. I am hearing something inside me. Something inside me is inviting me to inside, to live on the inside. I mean, at the time, I suppose, the woods, the dark woods in winter wouldn't frighten me. I mean, I was more frightened at that point in my life. I was more frightened of death than anything. It was only in my late fifties, but it was the first time that I really felt death is going to come to me. The unbearable feeling is not that I would eventually be annihilated, but that things would go on and I wouldn't be there. The fear of death, for me at that moment, I think was a fear those coming out of alienation. It's like to die alone. To die as if nobody cared. And that meant that it wasn't death I was afraid of. It was actually the idea of not being loved. And I've often seen people who are close to death in that journey and experienced from them enormous calm and enormous strength and enormous joy because they experienced being loved in that moment and in that journey and I've always been really moved by palliative care in Ireland and I've been really moved by the hospice movement I've been really moved by so many times that I've seen communities, nurses, hospitalization, all being part of a process that enriches a person's life as they're facing death. Because they're, they're allowing the person to feel loved. An extraordinary thing to say about love is that it just knows no boundaries. To say about love that that to love somebody, it makes them like they're not afraid of anything. They're not afraid of death. And I realized, I'd say at that time, even through my depression in 2011, it's where I really discovered there's nothing to be afraid of except alienation, except loneliness. A loneliness, not, no, not loneliness like like we all feel lonely and we all feel sad but how do I get to an experience that even in my loneliness or sadness there's something inside me tells me I'm not alone I remember the morning's greeting card and I remember I reached out my hands in the wood and I sensed the breath of twilight on them and I knew instantly that I had reached a moment of the day that is commonly described as bliss. In those dark woods, I felt bliss. All you have to do is reach out and touch it. And I felt I was physically reaching out in the woods and I was touching happiness. And I felt that there was darkness all around me. And I felt that there was winter all around me. And I felt that those things were inside me as well. They were the depression and the sense of isolation. And I sensed also that even in that loneliness and darkness, something was holding me. Something inside was speaking. I was listening to something. Something was comforting me. It, it wasn't even another human being and it wasn't even a squirrel. It, it was... It wasn't even the light coming through the trees. It was it was something really, really so deep inside that you could only say it's in darkness. Some big black hole inside me that felt like a black hole inside me, that felt like depression. And yet it was like the blackness felt suddenly alive, felt suddenly as if it was throbbing, as if it was a presence that knew me. 
and that I'd been looking at it and thinking it's a black thing inside me, being afraid of it, being thinking this is a terrible weight. I used to carry around this blackness inside me like it was a weight, like it was a, a burden to carry it around. I, I, I'm melancholic, I'm depressed. There's something inside me that's dragging me down, it's black. I can't name it. Maybe there's some psychological thing behind it. I used to wonder about that. I used to wonder, maybe is this something that happened in my childhood or something I've repressed or is it something from a previous life or whatever? What is it? What is this darkness in me? This big black spot inside. What is it? I began to feel it's speaking to me. This is love. It's speaking to me. I am loved. I am. I'm, this is so. This is so powerful. Inside, in that blackness, there is more light than is in the sun. This is love. Per tenebras ad lucem, they used to say in the medieval days. Through the darkness comes the light. My final salvation. My final completion was in the darkness there was love there was everything there was hope I know it's a funny time of the year to be sharing that with you but having the privilege to to talk to you to have a relationship with people who are listening to the podcast to say that it's actually the very depression and darkness that was the turning point that somewhere deep inside me there is being there is there is the signs and the traces of immeasurable being measurable love you know words can't describe this sense of what we used to call god's love in Buddhism, they would might maybe talk about enlightenment. There's, there's, it's just impossible. The minute you, you name it, you lose it. But it's a beautiful thing which is inside all of us. It is awakening in us. It's a beautiful thing. Immeasurable. It can't be talked about. It's, it's what in Islam they speak about as the secret. It is the secret that is yearning to be revealed the secret that reveals itself in you as your secret thank you for being here bye bye